Hey, how are you? Hey, I am doing great. I'm feeling kind of free and easy this week. I didn't have as much podcast Whoa. prep to do as we normally do. No uh, kidding, huh? Yeah, that Miroslav Wolf series was by far the best thing we've ever done on the podcast, but by far the hardest to prep for and the most time-consuming thing we've ever done on the podcast. Yep, I feel both exactly. I loved it. It was so good to dig into it, but I could feel the difference in my schedule this week that I was not prepping for an episode of Exclusion and Embrace. So it has been a little bit of a welcome reprieve, to be honest. Yeah, no, it really has. And, you know, so many of those episodes, they ran so long that we couldn't even get mm -hmm. to our thoughts segment. And you teased it out last week. Hey, maybe we should just make a whole episode about all the thoughts that we didn't get to share. And it's been weeks since I've gotten to catch up with all of the different strands of Josh from Missouri's thinking. So I'd love to just dive into a whole soup full of thoughts. All right. Thought soup. Here we go. The first thing that I have been thinking about actually goes way back to a failed book we attempted to read together. Um, oh. Yeah. I didn't I, know we ever stopped reading a book. One time. It was a collection of the poems of Gerard Manley Hopkins. That's and so we weird. we did not finish it. I finished it on my own. Okay, so which Josh didn't finish Gerard Manley Hopkins' book? Um, <laughs> but uh, I, pun intended, ran aground on Wreck of the Deutschland, which is <laughs> his longest poem. Yes. Uh, and frankly, a very difficult poem. Yeah. Very, very complicated poem. And I ran into Hopkins again recently. I was actually listening to Kurt Thompson's podcast, and he is doing this amazing series in which he is inviting his listeners to be, the phrase he's using is, in the path of oncoming beauty. Oh, that's in a it, great phrase. Isn't that a beautiful, like just a glorious phrase? And basically, each week, there is an, a beauty assignment that you're given that is going to be discussed next week in the podcast. So oh, uh, wow. one week, it's Ansel Adams, and you have to sit and look at an Ansel Adams photograph for some time to get ready for next week's episode or whatever. It's just wonderful. So he happens to have mentioned Hopkins, and I started listening to Hopkins as a result of his reference to it. And he made this one comment about poetry in particular and about art in general that I have found to be absolutely wonderful and that has opened up Wreck of the Deutschland for me. And the comment he makes is that art invites us to sit with it and experience it before we understand it. Hmm. The point I think that he's making is that we like to exert control over things. We like to put things in boxes, right? I get you, and I understand you, and I can interpret you because I know you. And poetry in particular, and Wreck of the Deutschland, as a great example of this, I have listened to Wreck of the jo Deutschland and read Wreck of the Deutschland half a dozen times this week. It, it's a, an eight-page, nine-page poem. It's very long. I am still not sure I grasp the general point that Hopkins is trying to make. There are whole stanzas that I fully do not follow. The first half of the poem is wildly confusing. Mm -hmm. But what I find fascinating is in the midst of all of that, if I'm willing to come to the poem and experience it without understanding it, there is an experience of beauty in the poem that precedes me, quote unquote, getting it. Does this make sense? It does. It is 
one of the things that I struggle with most about poetry, because that requires a sense of patience, a sense of allowing something to sit and ruminate. So it's a, it's, there's a duration involved in it. And my schedule doesn't allow for duration. I've set aside this time to read. I'm going to read. I'm going to comprehend and I'm going to walk away because that's what I have time for. So I don't think in terms of sitting and letting it just rest with me while I don't understand it, letting my mind just kind of chew on it. I, that's an approach to even reading the Bible that I've had to try to adopt. And we spent the whole last summer going through the Psalms, and I look forward to doing that again because I think there's a lot of Psalms that this approach is appropriate for. And mm. to just let this rest on me, even if I don't understand it, right? Like dash your children against the rocks, you know, vengeance is mine. I don't I don't get that. I don't understand. But maybe if I just sat with it and let it simmer, there would be a point in time in my life where it would connect back together. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the the willingness to read without judgment, right? I don't have to decide if this is right or wrong in the first 27 seconds of reading it. Because this is what we do, right? We yeah, oh yeah. Agree or disagree immediately rather than reflect. And all of this, I mean, first of all, it is inherently valuable if we want to see things as they truly are, to actually learn to set aside judgment and experience the world for what it is without trying to evaluate it. But it's second, really, the reason I brought this up as my first of a multitude of thoughts is it ties so well into what we talked about over the last couple of months with exclusion and embrace. This is a way to practice some of the things that we need to be able to do in order to embrace and accept somebody who's different. Hmm. It's the same practice in one situation applied to a work of art and in another situation applied to a person. Practice of letting the person be themselves and being open and curious and acknowledging that I don't have to understand or make a judgment in order to engage. Yeah. So that's my thought. That's great. Good stuff. Yeah. What about you? What have you been thinking about? Well, in addition to reading Wolf, I've been reading a couple of other books, uh, one of which is The Mission of God by Christopher J.H. Wright. Have you read this? Ooh, I haven't. It's on my must-read someday list. Yes, it was on mine as well. And I'm getting to it finally, and I'm super thrilled with it. I will say the first half of the book is pretty dry, uh, mainly, mainly because he's going through and building a case from scripture about kind of the, how do we see missions from a whole biblical perspective? And so in order to do that, he is explicating multiple texts all throughout the Bible. And so he spends, you know, maybe a paragraph on a bunch of different passages. And so it's, and it's not necessarily insightful exegesis of any one passage. He's trying to build an argument in totality. And that's the big takeaway. So each individual moment of the first half of the book is kind of laborious, but the big picture is what he's after. So uh, once he's got the picture built, he's really moving into some other forms of application and ways of looking at that data. And so that's actually proven to be the most interesting part. So when you read it, just endure the first half. Well, and, and the first half actually answers a question for me that I'm curious about. I have often heard an argument for mission in the Old Testament assumed rather than explicated. Mm. And so there is the inevitable reference to the call of Abraham and the blessing that is to the world in that text. Right. And then there's a reference to Isaiah here and there. And those are almost referred to as if clearly these are capturing an entire Old Testament theme, to which my response in my own head is honestly, I'm not convinced they are. I mean, I know that makes me a bad evangelical, but 
we always reference the exact same two verses <laughs> and two verses does not make a theme guys. And so I would love to hear an outline of a bazillion quickly referenced verses that make this argument. Yes. And I don't need a comprehensive exegesis of each one. I just need him to string them together kind of like pearls on a necklace to give me the whole big picture because I've never actually heard that. And that's if that's what you're looking for, that's exactly what he does. And it's wonderful. And his main thesis, this wasn't even my thought, but my, his main thesis is that God is on mission, that missions mm. begins with the character and nature of God, this self-revelatory God who designed and purposed a means by which he would communicate himself to the whole world. And that is his stated purpose throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament. And so if we are really going to pursue missions, we are getting on board with what God is doing. And I think that's a wonderful way to view missions. That's so good. I'm super curious to get to read that. Uh, like I said, it's on my must-read list at some point. Uh, yeah. Early on in seminary, this book came up in a class, and I added it immediately to my want-to-read list. It might have even been in my first semester. And so I went all the way through seminary knowing I wanted to read this and didn't get a chance to. And then it became one of the first things I did after seminary because it's one of the top books I didn't get to in seminary. I have a long list of those books, but anyway, this is what I read the first, mostly because I could mm. find it on audio. Yes, that often is the deciding factor, isn't it? Yeah, because I have way more car time than I have sit in a recliner time. So, absolutely. Well, he he's the guy who wrote. I mentioned months ago a book on Ecclesiastes that I re was reading. Yeah. Uh, and he's the person who who wrote that as well. I mean, and it was just brilliant. Yes. Phenomenal scholar, great communicator. So read his stuff. But here's my thought. All of that was preamble. Okay. As he was talking about missions, he talked about the fact that so often the text says, and you will be my people and I will be your God. And so mm. I think we identify that in one way, right? We recognize that Yahweh was uniquely Israel's God. But what we don't do, and what Wright did in his book, was flip the script and say, in other words, God tied his reputation, his visibility to the world, to this people. Mm. And I was thinking to myself, really? I mean, if you look at, and I've always been uh, amazed at this, if you look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you go, these are the founding fathers of Israel. And then you look at all of Israel's story as it's documented in the Old Testament. And you go, God tied his reputation to those people. However they behaved was going to be a reflection on God himself. And you think, really? And I'm sorry for the language, but this is my thought. Really? Those jokers? You want your reputation to be tied to whatever those people did? I mean, do you see what a disaster they are? And I realize in my own day and time, right, those who are known as quote unquote Christians, it's the same thing. God has tied himself to our identity as Christians. However, we behave in the world, good, bad, or otherwise, is a reflection on God. And God is not ashamed of his people. He is not going to change the way he represents himself to the world. He has committed himself to revealing himself in part through his people. That makes me take a step back and realize, quote unquote, those people, those Christians, giving all of the rest of us a bad name, we're all giving Christians a bad name and we're all in the same boat of being tied to God's revelation in the world. Ah, well, and it enlightens some of the passages because there are several times where Moses appeals to this theme in God's thinking, right? Mm -hmm. You know, God, if you destroy them now, how is that going to make you look? I mean, everybody's going to think that you're the kind of God that takes people out into the wilderness just to kill them. That doesn't yeah. make you look good. Right. Which is not the argument I would make. If I were standing before God, 
Like I would attempt to make a, no, no, God, this is just wrong, or this isn't just. I wouldn't try to make it a reputation argument to God, but if this is a thing that God does, is rest his reputation on people, and that he, if this is a thing he actually cares about, it may be that Moses understood that, and that's why he was responding to that. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned Moses and his way of thinking, because I just encountered somebody yesterday. I just had coffee with somebody yesterday. They're in full-time ministry, and they just made mention of the fact that they have prayed multiple times throughout their life, that if by their actions, they are bringing disgrace to God, that they would be removed from the world. Because there is nothing that they dread more than to somehow misrepresent God or to bring him dishonor. And he's like, it would be better off if I were not alive, if that's what I was doing. And I had never heard anybody articulate that before or even like express that in prayer before. But I think that's the same mentality that you're talking about with Moses. He was so concerned with the way that Israel would bring honor or shame to God, that that's the first place he went to when he said, you know, God, don't do this. It's going to look bad on you. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I love the way that you're bringing it into the contemporary reality, because it requires a special kind of arrogance that I am a master of (laughs) to, to think, boy, those people make us as Christians look bad while being completely dismissive of just how bad I have the capacity to make God look because his name is on me. Mm. Yeah, that levels the playing field, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And I think that was my big takeaway from this is, you know, God has, for better or worse, said his reputation stands or falls on the way his people behave, all of them even the jokers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he will be known throughout all eternity as the God of Jacob. Wow. Okay. That's good. So, all right. Well, if you don't mind, I'd love to turn the conversation to find out, Josh from Missouri, what else have you been thinking about? (laughs) I think we might have already been doing this, and it's, uh, (laughs) you know, this is an all-thoughts episode. (laughs) Uh, And so... Uh, the good news is I've been thinking about a million things. Oh, good. Uh, so we have a very this, long episode ahead. <laughs> this is There is no way we're going to get through my whole list. But okay. uh, I have been working my way through simultaneously, one in audio and one in print, two of Eugene Peterson's books, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places and Practicing Resurrection. And both are phenomenal. Have you read either of these? I read Christ Plays in 10,000 Places a long time ago, before I was really adept at reading Peterson. Peterson is very long-winded. He writes Mm. beautifully, but his sentences are a little laborious, and I kind of got lost in his writing, and I'd really love to go back and reread that. But I've never read the other one. So I'll get to all sorts of thoughts from Practice Resurrection next, but One of my big takeaways from Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, which, interestingly enough, is a quote from a Gerard Manley Hopkins poem, Uh but he talks about the presence of God in creation, in history, and in community. It's kind of the big picture of the book. But in the first section of it, where he's talking about the presence of God in creation, he talks about how the first chapter of Genesis captures all that God did in creating. And we who claim to be nature people, which you and I are both those people, right? Like Mm -hmm. a personal retreat means let me go out in the woods and experience nature. Yes. And he has this very penetrating and cutting challenge to those of us who claim to be nature people in asserting that the pinnacle of creation wasn't the trees or the woods or the rocks or the stones or the animals. It was people. 
and that an authentic love of God's creation will see the beauty of creation in people being people. Mm. That the same wonder that exists in the Grand Canyon exists in the guy who is making me miserable in traffic. <laughs> that the same peace that I can experience in the woods by myself, that I am invited to experience all of that in the pinnacle of creation, in human beings, and that somehow I am missing what God values most and truncating creation when I cut off the hard, messy bits. And this is an ongoing challenge, I think, that Peterson has for us, that we want to oversimplify and self-select when that is not an option God is interested in giving us. But this is just one great place where he challenges us to love creation and see the, the ultimate expression of God's creative work in people. Well, as I'm hearing you reflect on that, I actually am applying it in my mind in a slightly different way, because one of the things that I love most about getting into creation, as you said, like in a personal retreat, I want to get as far away from civilization as possible. I want to get deep into the woods. This is what I love about backpacking. You can get farther and farther away from anything civilized. I don't want to hear road noise. I don't want to hear people talking or machinery happening. I don't want to hear anything about civilization. And I don't want to see paved roads. I only want to be in pure nature. And as I think about, you know, the guy that's irritating you in traffic or the rough parts of society, that's not the way God intended it. Just like nature didn't come with a paved highway. Neither did human beings come with a sin nature. And so I think if I'm really going to apply this idea of creation and humanity being the pinnacle of it, what I need to do is dive far enough into an individual that I can see past all of that muck that humanity has made of the human experience and find that pure gold, that created essence of that individual that lies enshrined in all of this sin and sinful expression of life, because God created something amazing and beautiful underneath all of that, and we've just messed it up. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, I feel like we are echoing exclusion and embrace and all that we're saying so far, but, and then we turn our backs on the broken thing because it's not good enough or natural or what we wanted rather than doing the hard work that you just described, which I think is exactly the point. You have to do the work of backpacking a ways to find some of the best parts of nature. You know, we had a great trip this last summer, and but I had to drive 20 some odd hours <laughs> to get to see some incredibly beautiful things in nature. Right. You have to do an equivalent amount of work to see the beauty in individual people, even if it's a slightly different type of journey. Yes. And I, I don't know about you. Like This is a lesson I have to learn and relearn. There have been so many times in my life that I have found a person to be irritating or off-putting in some way. Maybe I find them to be better than me and like they wouldn't even want to talk to me or whatever it is that causes distance between me and them. And then something will happen and we'll actually get a chance to connect and get to know one another. And all of a sudden my brain switches and I'm like, oh, that person is not half as bad as I thought they were. Why do I have to keep relearning that lesson that every person is created in the image of God? There's inherent goodness in every single individual. We just have a sin nature in addition to all of that. And so we have to work our way past that sin nature to find out just who is this person. Yeah, exactly. Somewhere there is a quote that I learned when I was a kid that says, it's easy to hate somebody until you get to know them. 
Mm, yeah. And I think that's so true. Our shallow perspectives on who people really are, it's easy to be hateful, mean, dismissive. But boy, you get to know somebody's story and it is a different situation. But, uh, you know, with that in mind, I'd love to turn the conversation a little bit here and find out from you. Uh, Josh from Oregon, what else have you been thinking about? <laughs> I I feel like we need to like for every season you know turn 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 uh, we're just you know, we're just gonna keep hitting that but yeah um, yeah so I'm, it's not a good episode if it doesn't involve somebody singing <laughs> I'm not sure I think it's a, a not a good episode if we're singing but anyway I've heard uh, it, well I can't say I've heard it both ways I've never heard anybody compliment our singing I've heard plenty <laughs> of people ask us to stop. <laughs> I'm married to one of them. Um, yeah, me too. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I've been reading another book. I just finished up yesterday, a book called Praying Like Monks, Living Like Fools. Have you read this? Ooh, I haven't. Uh, it's by a guy named Tyler Staten. He, uh, for many years, was a pastor in New York. He is now, I don't know if he's still pastoring, but he's also connected with the 24-7 prayer movement which I mm -hmm. am new to and I don't know much about. But this was a really good, honest primer on prayer from a guy who has spent a lot of concerted time in prayer himself and not in a, I mean, I know monks is in the title, but he's not in a very holy, let me teach you about prayer. Like this is the gritty New Yorker, let me get raw and real about prayer and why it's hard for us, but why we should engage with it. And he just, he dives in in such a refreshingly honest way throughout the whole book. But one of the thoughts that I wanted to share about this book comes from kind of the ending of the book where he is talking about the need for consistency. And he used this phrase that I just thought was brilliant. It just captures so much. He said, fidelity is boring. And now I've never seen this movie. And if I get my way, I never will. But he references the movie, The Notebook. And as he tells it, because I've never seen this movie and I never want to see this movie. But anyway. Um, Amen. Uh, right. Uh, as he tells it, it's the falling in love story. And I don't know, maybe they, it, it ends in their marriage or something like that, but it's the falling in love story. And then it jumps all the way to the very end, and there's a scene with them at the at the end of life. And with this very mature love, they're still together. It's so lovely. And he said, there's a reason why he skipped all the stuff in the middle. It's boring. Fidelity mm -hmm. is boring. It's just the day in and day out constancy of being together. There's nothing magical. I mean, maybe there's some highlights, of course, right? But it's boring. But you don't get to the very end of the love story with this very deep, very mature, devoted love without all of that fidelity, without all of that boring. And he applied it to prayer and was like, look, to be consistent in prayer and to be faithful in prayer is the same thing. Fidelity is boring. You just have to keep showing up and dedicate your life to this. As odd as it is, I felt like that was a compelling image. Yeah, you're absolutely right. One of the signs, I think, of maturity is the ability to do the boring thing in the way that we're talking about it in this situation. Yep. Can I... So one of my thoughts ties in really, really closely to this. And I wondered if I could throw it in here rather than having it be a separate one later. Hang on. Let me do it. Turn, turn, turn. Okay. Or something. I don't even know. I, that wasn't even close. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. Again, why we don't sing on the podcast. Yes. But so this is from, do you know who Martin Thornton is? Nope. Nope. Neither do I. But he is someone that Eugene Peterson deeply respects, which is generally enough for me. Mm -hmm. But this is a long quote 
that Peterson quotes Thornton about prayer. And I thought it was a fascinating image, and I actually wanted to get your take on it. And it hits on this exact idea. So here's what Thornton says. He says, we must relearn the essential truth that Christian prayer is rather like cleaning a car. When we are lucky enough to have a new one, we wash and polish away with enthusiastic fervor. It's a devotional job. When the novelty wears off, it becomes rather a nuisance and rather a bore. But we can still clean it efficiently. And here is the one vital point. There is no difference whatever in the result. Hmm. What do you think about that? Because I loved it and hated it. Well, I appreciate the sentiment, right? Whether you're enthusiastic about prayer or whether you find it a bore, but you still do it, it's still effectual. Okay. I I agree with that statement. But Mm -hmm. he used the word efficient when it came to cleaning the car. And I don't love that idea as applied to prayer. And then he says that there's no difference. And I would disagree with that. I think he says there's no difference in the results. Well, okay. Sure. We're. Sure. Okay. No difference in the result, but I still, I I disagree. I think one of the aspects of prayer, not the only, but one of the aspects of prayer is its effect on us as the prayer. And you cannot get the same results in your first five prayers as you do as your 505th and your 1005th. Like that has a different Mm. effect on you as the prayer. And honestly, the scripture teaches it has a different effect on God. He uses multiple examples in the Gospels to say, look, if you're just pounding on the door constantly, a human is willing to finally give you what you're asked for just to shut you up. And that's how you should pray. So mm. like, I so need- you're going further than Thornton is going, not less far. You're saying the routine cleaning of the car that has all the novelty worn off, that version of prayer is actually more effectual. Yeah, exactly. The 30 years worth of continuing to wash the car even after it became boring, I do think is more effectual. Well, let me back up. I hope it's more effectual because I'd like to become that guy someday. And that's something I'm growing into. I when I grow up some. Yeah. Right, exactly. But anyway, wh- that's my reaction to it. And- In Thornton's defense, I don't think he would, or Peterson would disagree with you. I don't think that they're trying to say that mature prayer and immature prayer are equal. I think they're just trying to speak against the belief that the emotional experience of prayer as novelty makes prayer when it is new better than prayer when it is old and routine. Yeah. You know, so I I am confident that these folks would agree. And honestly, my I didn't go anywhere near there. One of the things that's a constant challenge for me that I love about what you were saying about boredom, what this particular quote is talking about, I hate boredom. <laughs> like everything in my being reacts against boredom. Uh, As a matter of fact, one of the interesting kind of traits that I guess a lot of folks who have ADHD have and that I resonate with, and I'm sure lots of people who don't, I'm not trying to say this is an ADHD thing or whatever. I'm just saying I have this thing that I do, and I found out that lots of people with ADHD have this thing that they do, and I find it interesting, and it is that as soon as a habit or routine becomes well worked into your life and it's going great. There is something in me that says, okay, I can't do that anymore. I'm done. Hmm. And it's not even reactionary. It is this dislike of boredom. It's not like I'm mad at the routine. It's, oh, now this is boring and I I react so. So this is this exact issue about boredom and routine as you can attest, has been a life issue for me for my whole adult life. And so there's a piece of me that wants to like listen to a quote like this or like that you read and say, 
no, 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 no. My heart is not fully engaged if I'm just doing the same thing over and over again. Then I realize I am evaluating prayer based on my experience of it as if that's the metric that matters. Did I have a good experience of prayer? I don't think is what matters in prayer. I think what matters in prayer is, did I have a conversation with God? You know, like, I'm not going to say, yes, I had a conversation with my wife when I felt like it was a good conversation. I mean, I need those ones that feel like a good conversation. I'm not saying that that's irrelevant. I'm just saying you have the conversations with your wife, whether they feel good or not, and you have to forget about whether or not they feel good, and eventually you will have ones that feel good. If you aim for the ones that feel good, you're going to have fewer ones that feel good. And I think prayer is probably similar. Yeah, well, and so I want to back up and say being consistent in prayer and being willing to be bored in prayer does not imply that you have to pray the same way every time, right? It's not like you have to Absolutely. just like kneel on your knees by the window every single day at 9 a.m., right? We have a variety of different ways that we communicate with our wife, right? From a mm -hmm. couple of minute conversation on the way out the door to a full on date to hopefully an anniversary trip or some extended time away, right? So the point is, I think you can still have a variety in your prayer life to keep it interesting, but you have to just stay committed to prayer as a concept, regardless of the method. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And this kind of flexibility has been a slow learning process for me. That definitely doesn't come naturally, but you are absolutely right. As a matter of fact, I have slowly become more and more convinced that you can be vastly more consistent with a flexibility regarding content and method than you can with a rigidity regarding content and method. Mm -hmm. I agree. So long as you have a wealth of options to choose from, right? If you haven't predefined mm -hmm. your options, then you might just have paralysis. Like, oh, oh, I got bored with that and I don't know what to replace it with. And now my prayer life is done. So, yeah, no, you're exactly right. This is why I'm so grateful for some grounding in historical Christian approaches to praying. Because over the last 40 years, I have gained a handful of methods of prayer that work for me. And when one stops being helpful to me, I just shift gears and can jump into another one. And and none of them are novel anymore, quite frankly. Yeah. There is no novelty, but there are a host of tools. All the tools are becoming well-worn tools. Mm. Yeah, which is exciting. I, you yes. know, well-worn tools. There's something about that. Like, so when Shelly and I got married, basically we inherited all of her dad's old tools and, you know, he passed away back in 1991. And so all of these tools at least predate that, but most of them go back even much, much further. And so some of them have his marks on them, but all of them just have those, that old tool smell and look and feel and there's something really amazing about pulling an old tool, an old, well-worn, sturdy tool out of the toolbox and using it. And I just pictured all of that when you said, my tools are steadily becoming well-worn. I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's good. Well, with all of these thoughts, you know, I want to turn to our audience. I am so curious what other folks have been reading, what other folks have been thinking about. Uh, we're going to actually put up a post this week that just says, what have you been thinking about? And we would love to have you post, uh, whether it's a book that you've been reading or a podcast that you've been listening to. Obviously, we know we are your favorite podcast, but you know, other <laughs> second rate podcasts. The ones and, that don't sing uh, on the episodes. Yes, yes. Um or it might be a conversation you had with somebody, or it might be something you were reading in the Bible, or it might be uh, just something you were thinking about as you were driving home the other day, whatever. We're just really curious to hear what you have been thinking about. And 
as we often say, if any of these things that we've been talking about are sparking thoughts for you, we would invite you to share this episode with somebody else and have a conversation with somebody else about uh, whether it's about prayer or routine or any of the other things that we've been talking about. We would love to have you do that. And with all of that in mind, now we will turn to our favorite part of every episode. It is time <laughs> to for sing. Which Josh? Okay. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right. Well, this week's Which Josh question is Which Josh has put warm water buffalo milk on his cereal? And that is me, Josh from Oregon. This was not there by choice. There has to be a story here. Oh, absolutely. I hope there's a story. I hope this wasn't voluntary. Oh, yeah. I just walked I just walked outside, milked the water buffalo, and I was like, ah, oh, this looks great. No. I was actually in <laughs> India on a mission trip, and the hotel we were staying at had a lot of uh, breakfast fare that they were doing what they could to replicate American fare for their American guests. And so they, one of the options was cereal and a jug of milk sitting next to the cereal. And I thought, all right, I'm in a cereal kind of mood. That sounds great. So I poured myself some cereal and then poured this milk. And only after I sat down to eat it, did I realize this doesn't taste like milk and why in the world is it warm? Um, <laughs> and uh, so, you know, later learned that it was water buffalo milk Presumably they had just milked it or I don't know if they reheated it because they think milk should be warm. I'm not really sure how this worked, but it did not really work for me. I mean, I, th I ate it because I'll eat it. That's fine. But, oh, that was not that was not good. Oh, yeah. I am not sure that I would have kept eating. What? I know this is not the point of the story, story but do you remember what kind of cereal it was? <laughs> Well, I sometimes when we have conversations, I think to myself, "What wavelength are you on? Like, what? How? How is that your question?" Um, <laughs> okay, honestly, my, that was my question because I was wondering if it was a kind of cereal that had marshmallows, and I was wondering if those horrible little marshmallows would be better or worse. Like, would help the situation or harm the situation? Uh, that, okay. This makes a lot of sense now. I have no idea what it was. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't any marshmallow cereal because I think I actually would have been curious about that very thing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, I'm, not, I'm just not sure if that would be better or worse. But yeah. So, if any of you out there have had warm buffalo milk on a cereal with marshmallows, Please let us know how that went. We would be very grateful. <laughs> That's such a specific comment. If anybody ever replies, I'm going to be just amazed. But Oh, I'll be so excited. It'll be great. Uh, but Well, we should probably turn off this episode and uh, call it a day. Oh, brother. <laughs> I Have you been saving that the entire episode? Well, you know, I'm just trying to say the word turn as often as possible. That's really just ever since the little musical that I failed at, I, I have to, you know, redeem myself somehow. All right. Consider yourself marginally redeemed, but we will talk again next week and it'll be great. All right. I can't wait. I'll talk to you then. All right. Talk to you then. Bye. Bye. Yeah.